Bibles, please. We're going to the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11. The Gospel of Luke, and uh, I'm sorry, chapter 10. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 25. I'll give you just a moment to find that. Luke chapter 10 and uh, verse number 25. And we're going to read down through verse number 27. And we're going to start into the parables. Uh, there's a couple, well, there's a couple messages I yet want to preach. And, um, and I may do that. We finished Joshua tonight, and I'll preach those messages probably uh, on Sunday night. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but anyway, we've got a couple more messages that I want to make sure we get on Facebook. And we appreciate everybody who is uh, listening on Facebook and uh, went on there and checked this week and and uh, just see who and how many people had viewed the messages and so forth. And uh, there was quite a few. And so praise the Lord that something like that, people can hear you all around the world. And uh, so that is a great blessing that we can use that technology to get the gospel out all around the world, wherever people are. And so... Praise God for that. All right, we are in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, and this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, let me just say something. Sometimes it is really, really hard to decipher whether it is a parable or a real story uh, because the events in some parables uh, could actually be true. Uh, and so whether the Lord is thinking of a real situation or whether he is uh, just making a, uh, what we'd say is a parable or a uh, making up a story or taking something from life and applying it to some spiritual truth, sometimes it's hard to decide. I, I, I searched, searched this week and uh, about how many parables they were. And uh, uh, some guy, guy said, well, there's 29. Another guy said, there is uh, 39. Another guy said, there's 70. And another guy said, there's 105. <laughs> so <laughs> you take your guess, amen. But I'll just preach uh, what the Lord lays on our heart and the ones that I think we need to see and uh, hear from. This is a familiar, this is one of the most familiar uh, stories in the Bible. And... Um, it is the Good Samaritan, the parable or the account of the Good Samaritan. And uh, one of the things that I used to believe, and I, I'm not sure that it may be true, is when the Lord said there is a certain man, and here he says in verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer tempted him. Uh, but then he starts into the parable in verse 30, and he says, a certain man. And so it may be that if that is true in the mind of the Lord, he is thinking of a certain man, not just anybody, not just a story to illustrate a truth, but he is uh, talking about uh, um, an account that he was familiar with, maybe that he, uh, somebody told him, or being God and he knows everything, he can bring something out of nothing and, and preach on it. Uh, a parable is a has been defined this way. It is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, it's a physical story. All of the things that Jesus said are physical in the in the illustration parable, but always has a spiritual meaning to it. And so we come to the story parable, whatever you want to call it, in verse twenty five. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you've got to understand, this lawyer comes, the Bible says, tempting him. He is trying to catch Jesus in his words. He did not come sincerely. He did not come with uh, really the desire to think that he's going to find out something about eternal life. He's trying to trap the Lord Jesus uh, in his words. And uh, you'll never do that. I mean, he is the word. And so he's trying, to, he's trying to set up a trap, I think. And the Bible says he tempted him, saying, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, number one, you don't inherit eternal life. 
uh, the only way you could think that you would inherit eternal life is that you get saved, become a son of God. And then the Bible says we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But you don't inherit eternal life. Maybe he was thinking uh, that he inherited from his parents. He's a Jew. Uh, he is a lawyer. That does not mean he goes to court. I mean, a lawyer was one who was uh, an expert in the law of Moses. He says in verse 26, he said unto thee, on him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And so he, he's asking the question, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then he said, What does the law say? Because he's a master of the law. What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, here's what uh, uh, the lawyer replied, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all my mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. And he that is Jesus saith in him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he... Here's the key, one of the keys. Willing to justify himself said unto Jesus. Here's uh, where he's trying to set the trap. And who is my neighbor? He's going to wish he hadn't said that. <laughs> and he says in verse 30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. Now it says he went down. Jerusalem is up on a mountain. It is, I think, the best mile I remember. Uh, remembrance is about 6,000 feet in elevation. You go down to Jericho. Remember where Jericho was? It was down by the Jordan River. And uh, that's the first city that the Jews conquered when they came into the land of Canaan. And he said he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest. You notice how many times he says a certain? A ch by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said him, unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, this is the account of the Good Samaritan. And you'll notice the Bible says he went to him, he took care of him, he poured in oil and wine. Uh, those have a significance about healing in them. And uh, set him on his own beast, took him, and then he went to this inn, which evidently means he uh, transversed uh, back and forth between uh, evidently Jerusalem and Jericho uh, many times because when he got to the end. He gave the man two pence, and he said, When I come again, so when I pass back by, if uh, you spend more than two pence to take care of him, I will repay thee. So this innkeeper trusted him. So he's been there before, and he has a good testimony that this man took him into the inn, is going to feed him, going to take care of him, and believing that this Samaritan is going to come back and pay the bill. Verse number uh, 36, Jesus now asks this question, which now of these three, so there's three people in the, in, the, in the context here, there's the priest, there's the Levite, and there's the Samaritan. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go thou and do likewise. And so Jesus is not saying, you know, a lot of times the Lord, when he was preaching, you would think that he was 
trying to tell people they have to do something to be saved. But it really wasn't. He was saying that if you're saved, if you have if you have inherited eternal life, as the man said, then here are some of the fruits you will bear. You know, Jesus said, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. It wasn't saying you have to do the will of God to get saved. He's saying, as always, if you're saved, you'll do the will of God. You'll want to find and do the will of God. And the same thing is here. Now, the reason that Jesus used this Samaritan as an illustration because we know uh, the Samaritans were uh, hated by the Jews. They looked down on the Jews. We assume that the man that was wounded is a Jew. And uh, the Samaritans were what they would used to call half-breeds. Do you remember in 722 B.C. when the children of Israel were taken captive into Syria, and uh, of course later on in Babylon, uh, what happened was their ancestors, the people who were taken captive, uh, entered married with the Assyrians. So you got Jews marrying Gentiles, and they produced, uh, and the offsprings were called Samaritans. It wasn't that they lived in a certain particular area of uh, of Israel, it was that they were considered um, intermarried. They broke the law of God. Their descendants taken captive. The Bible says the lady at the well was a Samaritan. And uh, and so that's why there was this, this is a great illustration because the two men who were priests and the Levite, uh, when they looked on their own countrymen, they said, they didn't say anything. They just passed by on the other side. And so you get the picture that they're walking down the road, uh, I guess evidently at different times, and they look over on the side of the road or down in the ditch, and they see this guy laying there. He's half dead. He, uh, he is evidently, they know that he's alive, but he's half dead. He's just maybe moaning and groaning. And they just go to the other side of the road, and they just walk by and act like they didn't hear him. And then the Levite comes by, and he does the same thing. He sees the guy laying over here on the side of the road, maybe in a ditch, uh, where he's been hidden or left by the thieves, the robbers, and uh, he just goes to the other side, and he leaves him there. And so that was Jews ignoring the need of another Jew. And then here comes a Samaritan, whom this man maybe even hated, because he was a Samaritan. He had, we would say, corrupted the pure line of the Jews, or his parents had, or maybe possibly um, he was a Samaritan because his very mom and dad uh, were, uh, one was Gentile, one was Jew, and so they, uh, they corrupted the bloodline, and he's half-breed, he is a... He is half and half, and so nobody wants to deal with him, and especially the Jews. And so he is saying, here's a man who is supposed to hate this man, and that man is supposed to hate him. But this Samaritan got off of his beast, his donkey probably, and he went down, got the man up, and the Bible says took him, put on oil and wine, put him on his own beast, which means guess what he's doing now? He's walking. He has to walk from here on out. He puts the man on the beast. And he goes to this inn along the way, along the journey, that evidently he has been to before. Maybe he has stayed there himself. The innkeeper knows him, believes him, and trusts him. Now, I want you to notice first point is this, the purpose of the parable. The context is that this lawyer, this uh, person who is supposed to be an expert in the law, is tempting the Lord. In verse 25, and a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, You've got to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, and you have to love thy neighbors thyself. Now there's two things that are revealed uh, about that in this parable. The first one is this, Who am I to love? Now, there are some things that we do not know about this man in the ditch. Uh, there are some things we do not know uh, about the Samaritan. But notice this, we do not know this person's name. His name is not given. We don't know his 
nationality. We're talking about the Good Samaritan. We don't know his name. He's not mentioned. Uh, we don't know if he is a Jew or a Gentile. We assume that he was a, a Jew. Uh, we don't know his social status. We don't know if he's really rich or poor. We don't know where his home was. Uh, we don't know his social standing or his financial standing. And so, really, we don't know anything about this Samaritan. It's just that he came by and uh, he looked at this man and whether he could tell that he was a half-breed or not. I mean, you know, some people look uh, half and half. That You can tell they're a sort of a medium color of whoever they married. But sometimes you can't tell just by looking. And so the question about comes, who am I to love? And it's not anybody with an important name. It's not anybody because they're Jew or Gentile or whether they're Baptist or not Baptist. It doesn't matter their social standing, rich or poor. That It doesn't matter uh, where his home was, where they come from. Uh, and so we conclude this. The second thing about this who am I to love is we conclude that we are to love everybody. We're to treat everybody with the love of God. And all I need to know is this, that God loves them. And if God loves them, whether they are sinner or saint, whether they're saved or lost, whether they're purebred or half-bred, it doesn't matter. God tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so Jesus died for every man. And God meant his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were in the ditch hurting, that Christ died for us and paid for our sins. He is saying that God uh, loves everybody without prejudice, without limit. God is love. And therefore, whatever God loves, he loves with all of his heart, soul, mind, and the strength. God loves everybody, and he loves everybody the same. It doesn't matter if there's law. The Bible says that God causes his, his uh, rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He calls the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. You can't tell whether a person is saved or lost by the way God treats them or by the number of blessings they have in life. I've talked to people and witnessed to people uh, who couldn't give you any kind of a testimony about being saved, but they would say, oh, preacher, I, I think I'm okay with God. He's just blessed me so much. Yeah, he blesses everybody. You can't tell that if you're saved just because God blesses you. The Samaritan, notice this, he made no excuses. He's not, he, he, didn't, he didn't pass by on the other side. He didn't say, I'm on a journey. He didn't say, I've got to get home. He made no excuses. And he didn't ask any questions. He didn't wake the fellow up, finally get him conscious and, and say, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? He didn't care. Jesus died for everybody. He asked no questions. He didn't pray about it. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of times we use that to get out of responsibility. We say, well, preacher, I prayed about it. Now, there's some things you don't have to pray about. And one of them is loving people, loving sinners. And loving the saints of God, love is commanded of God. God is love. The Bible says that if we hate our brother, uh, the love of God does not dwell in us. And so we love. He didn't pray about it. He didn't use that excuse. I don't see him nailing on the side of the road saying, Dear Heavenly Father, you think I should help this man or not? But we do that sometimes. I've had people say, well, preacher, I prayed about it. You don't have to pray about things that God commands us to do. Secondly, not only who am I to love, but how much am I to love? Look at verse 27. The last phrase tells us how much we are to love. And thy neighbor as thyself. He said, you are to love other people as much as you love yourself. And let's face it, we, let me put it this way, the natural man, the natural thing about people is they love themselves. And they think the best of themselves. And that's why they take selfies and put them all over the internet. 
because they love themselves. They think they're the most beautiful girl on the Internet. I'm the most handsome guy on the, on the Internet. And so how much am I to love? He said, you're to love those people as much as you love yourself. We're to love sinners as much as we love ourselves. We're to transfer this natural and carnal self-love and we're to transfer it to sinners, those who are down and out, those who need God and need Christ, those who have been beat up and left in the ditch to die, those who have been stripped, those who have been uh, just left hurting and bleeding and dying. He said we're to transfer this love that we have for ourselves and extend that same amount of love and that same power of love to that man who does not deserve it. He didn't even know what this man was. He looked at a man who'd been stripped of his raiment. I would say that this man... Uh, they, the thieves, thought that was a pretty nice robe he's got on. He could have been a rich man. And therefore, they took the robe. They took the, the, his clothing because it evidently was worth something to them. I'm going to tell you something. This, uh, this selfishness, this self-centeredness is killing us. It's killing our churches. It has affected a lot more people than we think it does. And a self-centered life, listen, it is a thing that, that causes people to be unhappy. They think that if I just do what I want to do, you've heard kids say, uh, you know, when I get 18 years old, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm tired of mom and dad telling me what to do. And the teachers tell me what to do. And the cops tell me I can't smoke marijuana. And I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get me a job, get me a car, get me this. And I'm going to be happy. That's the worst thing you can do to make yourself happy. Because the flesh can never be happy. The Bible says this. He that findeth his life will lose it. In other words, the man who is seeking to please himself, he is seeking his life, his way, his will, his desire, his dreams, his ambitions. He is seeking life. He's, he's trying to find his life. And God says you'll lose all that. You'll lose your happiness. You'll lose your dreams, you lose your ambitions, you'll do that. And this self-centeredness hinders our service, hinders our effectiveness, even if we are saved and we start down this road of pleasing the flesh and doing what's convenient, even as a Christian, it will hinder us from serving God effectively. Self-centered living results in unhappiness, it results in self-conflicts, divorce. The man says, I'm going to do this. The woman says, no, I'm going to do this. I, I want to do this. He says, no, I want to do this. I, I want to go here for Sunday dinner. She says, no, I want to go here for Sunday dinner. And everybody wants to go their own way. Suicide is a result of self-centeredness. When people come and they just come to the end of themselves, they say, well, I tried everything. No use living any longer. And kill themselves. If you don't think all that is true, think about the rich man in hell. He had riches, but he was deceived in the thinking that riches was the answer. It was not the answer. And he died, and the Bible says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. What about Lot? Lot said, I want the best pasture land. And Abraham's servant says, no, you know, Abraham's the boss. He gets the best pasture land. And so they start arguing over the pasture land. And you know what Abraham says? He says, Lot, take anything you want. That's selfless. But Lot was selfish. And not only did he take the well-watered plains, but he moved down to Sodom. That was his choice. I want to live in the city. I, I want to be down there where all the uh, rich people live. And I'm going to work my way up. And he did. When he got there, the Bible says that Lot sat in the gate of the city. That means he's on the city council of Sodom and Gomorrah, the most uh, wicked cities uh, uh, in, in that day that God poured his judgment upon. Why would you want to live in a place like that? 
under the curse of God. You know what he lost? He lost his family. Lost his daughters. He lost it all. Now notice this certain man, the people of the parable. There was a certain man who fell among thieves. So first of all, he fell among thieves. Didn't think he would, or he maybe would have been better prepared. He could not somehow fight off the, the thieves that had come to him. He probably didn't, wasn't armed. He didn't have a sword, a spear, or anything to defend himself because he wasn't expecting this. But he fell among thieves. I'm going to tell you, everything in this world is a thief. The flesh is a thief. It will rob you of your dignity and your integrity and your character. It is a Thief, it's in here. The heart, deceitful above all things and desperate. Look, it's the, th- the flesh that says you need to do this. You need to go there. You, this will make you happy. There's nothing about the flesh that will make you happy and there's nothing about the flesh that will bring continued happiness and joy and peace. The world will rob you. It offers everything. The young people say, I want to go out there in the world. I want to see what the world's all about. You're, you're, you're not only attacked by thieves, you're moving in with them. And they're thieves. And I, well, what's the old saying? There's no honor among thieves. One thief will steal from another thief. There's no honor in that. And the world steals people's identity. They don't, they're, not, they're not just people anymore. They're worldlings. They are worldly. And uh, then... Uh, they'll steal their testimony. It'll take them down a wrong road. And the Satan, uh, he is uh, d- d- robbing people every day. He robs them of just good common sense. He deceives him. The Bible says that it's the God of this world that blinds the minds of those who believe not the gospel. These people, the world, the flesh, the devil, they are not your friends. They always take and they never give. They are thieves if people could see what the world, the flesh, and the devil are doing to them. But the God of this world has blinded their minds. That's why someone, you witness the people and it's just like, they can't get it. They just can't get it. I mean, they, they can quote it back to you and say, yeah, I know if I repent and believe Jesus, I'll be saved. But you want to? No. Why? They still think the world can offer them as much as Jesus can. Notice the second thing that happened to this certain man they stripped him. And these things will strip you of your character, your decency, your honor, and your self-respect. Adam and Eve were stripped of their own glory. They're stripped of their relationship with God and had to be banned from paradise, the Garden of Eden. They were banned from their home. They were banned from that perfect place because they chose to go their own way. Instead of staying away from that knowledge of the tree of good and evil, they were right there evidently looking at it and the the serpent came down there and said, oh, look at that. This is wise. It'll make make you wise. Wise is God. That's why he's holding back on you. That's another lie the devil tells. God's holding back on you. How could you say that God's holding back on you when the Bible says he delivered up his own son? And how much more shall he give to those who love him? Think of Samson. He was stripped of his power, his testimony, his purity, his usefulness, came to the place where he was praying, Lord, just, I blew it. One more, one more victory. One more, one more attack upon the Philistines and I'm ready to go home. He knew his, his effectiveness, his life was over without a miracle from God. The world, the flesh, the devil will strip you. Number, verse number 30, he was wounded. You know what's wrong with the people out there? They're spiritually wounded. They're emotionally wounded. They are sad. They are unhappy. They are distressed and depressed. The Bible still says the wages of sin is death. And these things will leave you, they'll leave you hurting and bleeding. 
Listen, the world, the flesh, they don't care for you. They hate you. You're part of the family of God, even a sinner. They don't love the sinner. They're not trying to make the sinner happy, except in a way that will keep them from searching after God. If the world can just give them pleasure after pleasure after pleasure until one day they die and go to hell, that's exactly what the world, the flesh, and the devil want to do to people. They're not your friend. Notice the next thing it says, he was half dead. He was on his way to dying. He was halfway there. The Bible says that men are spiritually dead. But before I was saved, I was half dead. The Bible says ye are dead in your trespasses and sins. That's my spiritual side. I was spiritually, I was dead. But physically I was alive. I was half dead. The important part was dead. And the Bible says... The eternal part was dead. The important part was dead. And God told Adam and Eve, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And that day they ate, they spiritually died and became half dead. And every person who's been born since Adam and Eve have been born half dead. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. And ye are dead in your trespasses and sins. He said, but God has quickened you. God has had grace on us. When I was dead, God came to me and let me see enough light that he resurrected my dead spirit and gave me life. And not just life, but eternal life, everlasting life. And he brought me into his family. And now when I die, I'm going to heaven when the, uh, the spiritual part now will never die, but the physical part is going to die. And when it dies, I'll get to be with him in glory. And then the Bible says they departed. These thieves departed. Sin, Satan, the flesh, the world are not lifelong friends. Well, they call it BBF, best friends forever. They are not BBF. <laughs> they are not best friends forever. They will depart. When, they, when you have nothing more to give, They'll just leave you. Nothing more. Ask the prodigal. Man, when his money ran out, his friends ran off. And left him swapping hogs in the pig pen. Ask the man whose teeth has fallen out because of heroin. Ask him now about how wonderful the world, the flesh, and the devil is. Ask the girl who gave herself to her boyfriend and lost her decency and her honor and her, her purity and her virginity and left her for a prettier face. They'll always leave you. That boy will leave her for another girl who he thinks is more prettier, has maybe a shapelier figure, whatever it may be. But thank God, listen, Jesus did not come to hurt me. He came to help me. Just like that good Samaritan, he came to help me. So there was the certain man who was robbed. Number two, there was a, a, a Levite and a priest. And we'll put them together. Just say a word. He said, by chance, in verse 31, there came down a certain priest. When he saw him, he wasn't ignorant. He wasn't, didn't have his eyes closed. He passed by on the other side. And likewise, what would likewise mean just like he did, a Levite, when he was at this place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Don't want to be bothered. On their way from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem downhill all the way to Jericho is about a 22-mile journey. And they're on their way. And here are here is a, a Levite and a priest. Here are people who are supposedly to care about people. Not only their physical state, but their spiritual state. Here's a priest who probably has stood at an altar and offered sacrifices that a man brought to him to make atonement for his sin. And when he, he offers no help. It is religion, but religion can't help you. Being good can't help you. Being a priest can't help you. I don't care what kind of priest you're here. You might be a Buddhist priest. You might be a Catholic priest. You might be a, a Hindu priest. You might be some kind of a priest. But I'm telling you right now, they cannot and will not help you. They'll leave you half dead. Notice they made excuses. I'm sure in their mind they made excuses. 
no time. I'm on a journey. I've got to get to Jericho on a certain timetable. They're not able to help. They don't, you know, they've probably said in their mind, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know first aid. I don't know CPR. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to help this man with. So they just went on. This is a dangerous place. I mean, evidently there are thieves in this place. They probably live in that place. Maybe that was on their mind where they said, I've got to get out of here because those thieves that left him like that, they may come looking for some more stuff and they may leave me in the same condition. And so they had no faith. They just made excuses. The Bible says they passed by on the other side. Let me ask you a question. In this parable, you are one of these people. The question is, where are you in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Are you the certain man who's been the sinner, who's been stripped and left half dead? Are you um, a priest or a Levite who are religious but lost? Are you passing by on the other side? You say, how am I going to do that? That's what happens when you don't invite other people. When we don't witness to other people. When we don't go up and down the hollows here and knock on doors and say, can I tell you about Mill Creek Baptist Church and about the Jesus that we preach? When you passing by on the other side, you don't, give, you don't tithe, you don't give to missions so that sinners can be reached with the gospel. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Do you give to missions so the lost around the world can be preached to, witnessed to, given Bibles, given tracts? Or do we just pass by on the other side? Pass by on the other side. A lot of people pass by, by this offering plate and never put a dime in. Church runs on that. Do we see the need? They saw him. It wasn't ignorance. They saw and just passed by on the other side. I mean, there's a need. There are people that need invited. If we get enough, like we, we used to have, we, we would need teachers to teach classes. We might need another bus driver or a bus route. Souls that are, need a track or an invitation. Missionaries that need money. There is always a need. A need. The Levite and the priest just said, let's go on our journey. And the last one is, of course, the Good Samaritan. Verse 36 and verse 37. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the obvious answer, verse 37, he said, Well, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go thou and do likewise. And that probably hit him pretty much between the eyes because he's out trying to trap the Lord. He's not out trying to find somebody to get saved. He's not trying to get somebody to come down to the temple and offer a sacrifice and put their faith in Jehovah. No. And this good Samaritan, first of all, it pictures the Savior. It pictures Jesus. Here is Jesus who left heaven's glory. He left the security of our heavenly, holy city, Jerusalem, and he came down to this earth and he died. He just didn't give something that uh, maybe cost him a lot. He gave his life that we could be saved. Life that we could be healed. Life that we could go from half dead to, to fully alive. Half alive to, to eternal life. It's what he did. It's a picture of the Savior. It's also a picture of the saved man. Man who's saved, who, who uh, you know, the unsaved cannot experience the love of God. That's only put in us, Romans 5. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost whom he hath given unto us. And so saved people can love others like God loves them. Not, the problem is we don't do it consistently, we don't do it continually. But we need to ask God to help us to love those in need. And then it pictures the spiritual man. I only just say, but spiritual man. Notice it says he came to him. Came to him, willing to go wherever, willing to go to any extreme, to meet the need, willing to use all of his gifts, 
of oil, wine, his beast, his money. He sees the me, the uh, the need of the lost, dying, helpless, hopeless, hell-bound sinner in our day. That's what we need to see. Does all in his power to meet that need. He gives everything, including up his, you know, he's not riding the chariot now, he's pushing the chariot. And then notice he came to him, and then it says he poured in oil and wine. Oil is the Holy Spirit. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Men, men get saved, they receive the Holy Spirit. The picture of salvation, the wine is a picture of the blood of Jesus. When Jesus was at the Last Supper, and he gave them, the Bible says, the fruit of the vine, that's grape juice, and gave it to them, and said, this is my blood of the New Testament that is shed for many for the remission of sins. Sinners need the Spirit of God to convict them. And they need the blood to cleanse them. He had a spiritual solution. And he had a permanent solution. That's what Jesus does for us. He has a spiritual solution because we're half dead. And he has a permanent solution. Eternal life. Poured in the oil and the wine. Much could be said about that. And then notice verse 33, he had compassion on him. Here is the opposite of selfishness. Here he will overcome his fear, his bashfulness, whatever it may be, because he's not thinking about himself. He's not thinking about those thieves that may be looking over the hillside. He's not worried about his own welfare. He's died to self. This is the opposite of selfishness. And this compassion is not just tears. It's not just sympathy. Compassion is seeing a great need and doing all that we can to meet that need. The Bible said Jesus saw the multitude as sheep not having a shepherd and he had compassion on them. It's not just praying. It involves doing and binding up wounds and using your oil and your wine, even at great cost, even at sacrifice. This man slowed down his journey. This man stopped by a place he probably evidently wasn't going to stay himself, stopped by the inn to drop this man off because he knew he needed immediate help and he couldn't give it to him on the road. And maybe it's a long way still to Jericho. Sets him on his beast. Now he's walking. That's sacrifice. How many miles did he walk alongside that donkey? Compassion is not an emotion. Compassion is action. It is not something you just feel. It is something you do. And that's where we fall short. The Bible says in verse 34 that he set him on him beast and brought him to the end. Now, in this last point is the application, the plan of the parable. How should we, how should we put this plan into action today? Well, it's like this. You go to someone's home. You tell them about the Lord. Maybe they get saved. Maybe they don't get saved. But you say, listen. We want you to come to church. And I'll come by here tomorrow morning and I'll pick you up in my car. Because you know what people say? Well, I don't know anybody at that church. You know me. I'll pick you up in my car and I'll take you to church. I'll sit with you in church. But you need to be in church. You need to be around the gospel. You need to be around about Christian people. And so you drive your car. You spend your gas. You pick him up in your car. You bring him to church where he'll find... You take him to the end. You know what the end is? This is the end. This is the spiritual motel that he needs to be brought to. Rest. He'll find rest. Spiritual rest. He can find fellowship here. He can find real love. The world does not love him. His friends do not love him. He'll love, find love here. That's why we need to love one another. And, and it's just practice to love everybody that walks through that door right there. You need to express your love to them. He'll find healing here for his soul. He'll find healing. You know what? Do this. We don't have very many months left in this year, but we'll ask God to help us get somebody in church, 
somebody saved, somebody on your prayer list or not on your prayer list, they hit them and come to church and then pray God would save them. Now let me ask you a question. Where are you in, the, in this parable? Are you the certain man, the sinner, who needs salvation, who needs to be rescued? Are you a Levite or a priest? You're religious but uncaring. Let's just walk them by. We just walk by. We walk down through town. We never give anybody a track, never invite them to church, never do anything. Or are you the Samaritan, the spiritual man who stopped, spent his time, his energy, his oil, his wine, used his beast, invested his money, paid for his care? Are you in the parable? You are in the parable. You have to figure out, where am I in this parable? Let's bow for prayer, please. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.